Hey guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. It is Q&A Tuesday. Are you ready? I am totally ready. Uh, I didn't get a lot of questions this Q&A Tuesday, but that's okay. I went back into the vault <laughs> and I got out some classic questions and some questions that I thought needed to be reiterated again. So uh, I, that's what I did for today's episode. Now, if you're brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. I have been a medical coder for over 10 years. I created my channel with the hope of sharing all the things that I know about this field of medical coding with all of you. So I hope that you'll hit that subscribe button. I hope that you'll like this. And I hope at the end of this video helps you, I hope you will share it. Okay, so let's get started. All right, first question. Uh, what is the best thing about medical coding? The best thing about medical coding, I would say, would be the fact that it doesn't get dull. There's always something new. You are constantly learning. Um, that is one of the best things. The other best thing is that you are working around some of the most in intelligent people you will ever meet in your whole life. And that I really love because I am a person who values intelligence. I am a person who values knowledge. And when I get to marry that up and work in a place where I can have these intelligent conversations and these wonderful um, things that I can learn, it's just, it's, I don't know, it's just, <laughs> and, and to me, it's what makes this field amazing. I love to read and, you know, the most majority of the, of medical coding is reading. So that's what I really love about this field. It has provided very well for me for over a decade that I've been in it. Uh, it's been consistent. It has been a constant uh, and I, I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, I always say medical coding found me. If you haven't been through my videos, I should link the one video that I talk about um, how medical coding found me. And I hope that you'll watch it because it really did. And I think when you have a profession that sort of seeks you out the way that mine did, uh, the way that medical coding did for me, I think it's really awesome. So that's what makes uh, medical coding awesome to me. <laughs> the next question is a follow-up of that. What is the worst? The worst part of medical coding, I would have to say, is when people don't take our positions seriously. When we are dismissed, um, because you'll find that sometimes, you'll find people who, oh, you know, we don't really need medical coders or, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, and it's simply not the case. You still need a qualified person to look over this documentation and to be able to dig because a lot of times people like providers, they don't know that they can get credit for things. And it's not until a qualified, detailed medical coder starts really looking at their documentation. And if they really do care, this coder will dig and look and see, not to try to, to up the revenue, because that's not the whole point. We, we as medical coders, we never code based on money. We always code based on documentation. I am always after the quality of the documentation. I, I push my providers to make sure that they're putting all those details in there and they get mad and they, yeah, they get fussy and they don't wanna do it and we never had to do it before, yes, but your, your numbers, as far as like what you're producing is actually now reflecting what you are doing in your visits. So I think there's a lot to be said about that. So if you, if you enjoy what you do, if you love what you do, the money will come. Okay. I'm just saying, so you don't have to worry about that. That's why I always say, and that is our mantra as medical coders is that we do not code based on money. But if the coder is taking the time with the provider, it will show up, okay? Everybody will be, it, it will be fair. It will be fair for the patient. It will be fair for the provider. It will be fair for the facility. And everybody will be fair, okay? As long as you're paying attention to the little nuances and things like that. And before you think, how do I know? How do I know the nuances? How do I know to, that there's something missing? When I talk about having and building those relationships with your providers, sometimes things come out in conversation. I've had conversations with my providers and I ask them when I first meet them, how does a typical appointment look for you? What, what is it that you typically do? Is there a routine or, or something? And they sort of start talking about it and I keep that in my mind and I keep that in my memory. And then later on when I'm looking in their documentation, I start to notice 
Um, if they start to write something and it's maybe incomplete, the information is incomplete, that's when I start to question. And I start to think back on that conversation. Okay, they did mention that they do this in the conversation. Where is it? It looks like they started to describe it and then they stopped. So what what is what is missing here? Why are we missing this detail? So, and a lot of times you'll hear from them, well, I, I was always told we could never get credit for that. Really? Because it says it right here in the book. So it really does depend on the coder themselves if they are willing to look at this documentation and dig and try to find out where those holes are, you know. Uh, but yeah, getting dismissed is, is one of those things. And, and you'll find that sometimes. Uh, hopefully not a lot, but you will find it. Um, one of the other worst things about medical coding is when people think that we can learn this in a few days and we can't. This is a process and it is a, uh, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. I say that all the time because we have to learn a lot. And when I see these accelerated programs, it bothers me because what are you producing? What kind of medical coder are you producing? You have to give medical coders the ability to be able to critically think. Yes, it is on the medical coder, but you have to teach them how to critically think. And that's missing a lot of times. Uh, and you'll see that a lot in facilities where a coder will get in and they will ask how to, how does this, how is this clinic coded? And that is all they'll do. And they don't really look at those details or they're not really looking at that, at the, at the most specific co codes that they can. And it, and it happens, especially if the coder is not thinking to ask questions or if the coder is not thinking that there's anything missing here. OK, so that's that's, you know, really one of those things. So uh, but yeah, that would be all the things that I would think of um, that would be worst. <laughs> uh, and if you oh, another thing, if you are trying to uh, prove your argument in an audit, OK, uh, because all medical coders get audited by their supervisors or somebody from data quality. And <laughs> if there's a disagreement and maybe the person who is in data quality or the supervisor says, you will code it this way uh, because I said, and there's nothing to support. You know, that is one of those worst things because uh, you should never code because somebody says, because I said so. They need to have facts. They need to have the reasons why they need to have the rationale. And if they say, well, I don't need to have that. Yes, you do. It's actually, it's part of the ethics is that you do not miss code to appease somebody else. So I always uh, suggest that you guys look up those things, look up all the things that you need to know. Um, ethics is really huge. And I will probably leave the link for the uh, HEMA uh, standards of ethical coding uh, in the description box below. But that is something very important uh, to know. Okay. So next question. I want to go through in the AHIMA online program. Where do I go? It is a little confusing how to get to it. I would just go ahead and leave the link down in the description box below for it. Uh, but it is found in the store. If you go to the AHIMA website, ahima.org, you'll be able to find it in the store and it's the coding basics course. Okay. That is their online program. Okay. For medical coding. Okay. Uh, the next one is, um, I have no medical background. Can I be a medical coder? Of course. I had no medical background. The vast majority of us do not have medical background uh, before we get into studying it. <laughs> so if you have no medical background, you are in for a lot of learning, but you it is possible to learn it. Um, you just have to study, you know. But yes. Next question. How did you know you wanted to be an outpatient coder? I sort of didn't really think about what setting I wanted to be in when I first uh, got credentialed and, and got my first job. All I cared about was that I got a job. <laughs> it didn't matter where they put me. I, I, you know, I would have picked up anything at that point. Uh, all I wanted was to just get my foot in the door. And I got my first job through a temporary agency that staffed for uh, medical professions. So they did nurses, they did LVNs, uh, doctors, things like that. Um, and then of course they had medical coders. So wherever they put me was wherever I started. And I started in the outpatient setting. So that was where it sort of took off from there. I swear I started learning the ropes and I started learning 
about the coding and then the different settings, you know, inpatient versus outpatient versus professional fee, pro fee coding. So it's, it's a huge thing. But um, when I started, that was, that was just how I started, you know. Uh, the next question is, how did you decide you liked one specialty over another? So a lot of you will know that I have said that I really love orthopedics and podiatry coding. How did I know, how did you know that you liked to, to code this? It all started <laughs> many moons ago. So the thing is, I, I have always enjoyed my work. I've always enjoyed my work, but it wasn't until I had moved into this brand new, big, beautiful hospital that they had moved us into. Uh, we had been staying out in a ancillary building, okay, at my facility. And then we had this big, huge, beautiful, brand new hospital built. And they said, okay, we want the coders to be embedded in the clinics. So we're going to create space for them because in this old hospital, there wasn't a lot of space. This hospital was built um, a probably in the 40s or 50s. <laughs> I mean, it is old. It is an old building. And um, so with this new hospital, they said, okay, we're going to make space for the coders and we want the coders to be embedded in the clinics. Okay, cool. So fast forward to moving into this hospital and I had a partner at the time and we decided to do a, a um, like a, a hello. So we had an open house for our office, okay? We brought in like uh, donuts and we brought in little fruit cup thingies that we made and um, just to say hello and just to, to introduce ourselves because I had brought in my idea of, hey, I like to bring food. That's how people come together. So donuts is not a huge deal. So, <laughs> and it just sort of took off from there. Well, then I started meeting all the people that I was going to be working with, you know, all the doctors and stuff. And at before that time, I had not met really hardly any. I had seen some of them come in and out, um, but it wasn't like, hey, I know this doctor, I know this doctor, and they know me. It was always by email. So being with them, right, uh, I started to develop relationships and started to ask questions and learn more. Fast forward to, <laughs> I know I'm fast forwarding a lot, but fast forward to the infamous Dr. X. Dr. X, I talk about a lot on my channel. He is very influential in my career as a medical coder because of the simple fact that he was the one who sort of started it all, like with me questioning things and for, for me being as proactive as I am now because I didn't really think about it in the beginning, right? They're doctors. They don't have time. They don't have time for me. They don't have time. They don't want to know what I have to say. You know, what 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 do I have to say that is going to be so important to them? That was my thought process. That was the toxic thought process that I had. And I say toxic because I didn't know. I didn't know any better, okay? And so anyway, he had made a complaint and he had said, well, you know, uh, I, I don't hear from my coder. I don't even, you know, I don't know if I'm doing good. I don't know if I'm doing bad. You know, she never talks to me, which this was not true. Okay. He documents very well. And I never had an issue out of him. I would occasionally email him and say, oh, this was really good note and things like that. I mean, this was just basic stuff. And he was like, oh, okay. Very cavalier and you know, whatever. And so he never really said anything else. But I always said, if you have any questions, please let me know. But I was not proactive. I was not proactive with going over there physically. And that's what he wanted. He does not like email. He likes face-to-face. -face. He likes to know what's going on because he says email is too much. Okay. So he had made this complaint. The, the administrator that he made the complaint to came over to my office and he's like, well, you know, who is the doc who is the coder for this doctor? And I call him Dr. X because to protect his privacy. And I said, oh yeah, that's me. And he's like, well, he says he doesn't hear from you. Well, of course I was upset. I was upset because really I, I, I do, I do my work. I, I don't bother him. You know, what is this, what is this guy's problem? So I said, that's okay. I said, you know what? I'm going to go over there and fix this right now. So I go over to his office and I'm knocking on the door and he's like smiling away and he's like, oh, you know, hi. And I'm like, hi. And I said, so I heard from a little birdie and I said it just like that. I heard from a little birdie that you have a problem with my communication. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, I, I just I would like to have more communication with you. 
And I said, okay, well, I've asked you before if you have any questions to let me know. He goes, how do I know what questions to ask? And that was his question to me. And I'm like, well, how does he know what questions to ask? How does he know if he's doing good or bad? This makes sense. I said, okay, well, I will have to start being more proactive. And I told him, you know what, I'm sorry. I will be more proactive with you. I will make sure that I'm going through your documentation and I will make sure that if there's any issues that I come straight to you. And he's like, okay. You know, and so that's what started it all because as he's talking and I said, okay, let me start with a basic question. So I started asking him what typically happens in a visit. And he's kind of looking at me like I have three heads and I'm like, no, just, just go with it. You know, what, what typically goes on in a visit? So he starts telling me and I said, hmm. I was like, I didn't notice that in your note. I was like, you know, why, why don't you? Oh, well, I heard that, you know, we don't get credit for that. Mm. Now we're cooking with grease. Okay, oh well, no. <laughs> Whoever you're listening to, I mean, I don't know what, what coder you're listening to from before, but it's just like, you know, you're harming yourself if you're, if you're you know, not putting in all the detail. You know, he's like, well, I do document it. I was like, yes, but it's not in detail. I can't pick up things that don't happen. He goes, well, it's just common sense. Again, it's not common sense because with medical coders, we cannot assume. So then it became a, like, he started to understand my function. And of course I understand his function, but it just became a little bit more clear. So having this good relationship and it's starting in ortho, you know, uh, and ortho being quite difficult in specialty itself. Um, when we did the changeover to ICD-10, which it was around this time, they were saying that um, this is going to be difficult with the injury coding, you know, good luck, you know, because this is going to be hard, you know. Okay, I went through a program at work to, for the transition, and I also went through a supplementary program with another agency so that I could get double the training to understand what was happening. This little action that I did helped me to really further my understanding of what was going on with injury coding. So it made it a lot more easier and I was more advanced than everyone else because I got it. I mean, I understood. I had a really good teacher at second place and I was just like, oh, okay, this makes sense. Now this makes sense to me because the way it was explained at work wasn't making quite as much sense to me. So I got lucky there. <laughs> but once you start learning and you start getting all these other little bits of information, that's what makes everything flow and go good. And by extension, of course, I have podiatry as well. So podiatry was along those same lines with the injuries and everything else. So it's just like that worked out as well because I have really good providers there too. And just working with them and being one-on-one -on -one with them and being so proactive and so hands-on with them is really what shaped um, my enjoyment of that clinic. I have done pretty much every specialty in the hospital uh, except for cardio <laughs> at this hospital. I did it at the previous hospital that I was at, but um, I've pretty much done everything and I like the challenge of injuries. I like the challenge of the organic conditions. I like that. I, I think that with other specialties, yes, neurology, pulmonology gets very detailed and very intense. But with, with that, it's just, I don't know, it just became a preference, you know, and uh, <laughs> that's my answer on that one. I know it was a long way around, but this is the classic Q&A Tuesday, so <laughs> I guess that's okay. All right, so next question. Uh, I am a mom. Is this a good field for me? When I first started here, all of the mothers, all the women that were in the department were mothers, two little kids. So yes, I do think that this is a good field for mothers. There's plenty of women in this field. I always say Men are welcome <laughs> because I think a good gender balance would be really great. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to see the video that I put out when I was in Chicago uh, last year for the Ahima conference. Embarrassing story. So I'll go ahead and tell it. 
<laughs> we had to catch the bus to get to the to get to the convention center, right? From the hotel. So we had to go a couple of blocks to to catch the bus to go over there. Cause in Chicago, everything is so far apart. And yes, they do have the the different trains and subways and things like that, but it was just easier and it was literally a chartered bus that would take you from the hotel to the convention center so we didn't have to do all this hopping around. Okay, cool. So we go and all the charter buses look the same. Coincidentally, there was another conference going on at the same time. This was for uh, oncology radiologists. And all of the all of the people from this conference, of course, we're all well dressed. I mean, we're all business casual and everything, business professional. We're all dressed up. And then you see like a group of men. This it was just all men that was in this group for uh these oncology radiologists. And so all like I said, all the buses look the same, they're all going to the convention center, <laughs> but of course Ahima had their own. So <laughs> All I did was see the bus and I go, oh my gosh, girls, we got to go because I was with a few other girls and we were all going to catch the bus together. So I'm running to, to catch the bus because I didn't want the bus to take off because then we were going to have to wait another 20 minutes and then, you know, and then, and then, and then. So I, I jump in there and I said, oh, I said, I'm so glad we caught you. And the bus driver was like, yes, ma'am, come on in. So I get in there and I'm looking and I look in this bus and I see nothing but well-dressed men in this bus and I'm like wow and I was like hmm there's an awful lot of men I was like well maybe they must be from some facility somewhere and I'm like oh hello good morning you know be nice <laughs> social hello hello you know because like I said all very well dressed you know and that's another one thing I I really like to see is a well-dressed man I'm just saying <laughs> anyway so I go in there and I and I sit down and I'm saying oh you know good morning hello and then all of a sudden I hear, Blue, we're on the wrong bus. And I go, oops. <laughs> so, of course, they're all looking at me and they're smiling, you know, and some of them are like, <laughs> and I go, just kidding. <laughs> and I, so of course, I took off, but I was like, wow. And they go, Blue, if you wanted to just stay on the bus, I go, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, we got into the right bus, but like I said, there's very few and far in between men in this field. So if you are a male, yes, we do welcome males. Uh, that is another question that I get a lot too is, uh, can men do this? Of course, of course you can. So, but yes, so learn from my mistake, okay? Always look at the signs on the bus when you are, <laughs> when you are at conference. Just say it, okay? Next question. <laughs> um... Do you see the field continuing to grow even with advances in technology, i.e. Uh, artificial intelligence? Of course, because artificial intelligence is just like it sounds. It's artificial intelligence. It's only going by set parameters. It only knows as much as you're telling it to know. Okay. We are a long way from where a, a computer can read a note and decipher uh, human colloquialisms and be able to to come up with uh, a correct level and a correct diagnosis. It is looking for words. It's looking for key phrases. That's what it's looking for. You still have to have the human element. And like I said, we are still a long ways away. Yes, we do have encoders now. Encoders are a lot different from our actual artificial intelligence that they're trying to push and think that they're going to be able to eliminate us coders. Like I said, we are a long way from that, okay? Uh, next question. Do medical coders work around a lot of people? It depends on the facility that you're at. Sometimes you are working in a room with a bunch of people in bullpens, right? Bullpens being like those little cubicle things. Or you could be in your own office or you could be sharing an office in a clinic. It really all depends on where you are applying and where you're working. Okay, so uh, just be sure to ask that when you are interviewing. Okay. Next question. Do Does having multiple credentials help you get a job faster? No, because you have to have the experience behind those credentials and you have to be able to 
show that you can do all of those things. So just to just to get and rack up a bunch of credentials just to make yourself look good. Remember, you still have to report all the continuing education units for all of those credentials. And those get expensive after a while, especially if you're exceeding the amount that maybe your employer is giving you, because for some employers, it is a benefit of your employment to get free continuing education units. Uh, for others, they, they give stipends so that the person can go and do whatever they want to do as far as like take classes or whatever to have their continuing education units. And some, some places it's, it's, they don't, they don't bother with it. They leave it to the coder to take care of that themselves. So always be sure that when you are continuing to get more credentials, that it is for specific reasons. Don't try to double up on the same credential. Okay. Uh, if you have a, um, uh, if you have a CPC and a C CIC certified inpatient coder and a, and a certified professional coder, and then you get a, a CCS, that's a lot saying the same thing. Okay. Uh, it is saying the same thing. And generally, I mean, when people are looking for credentials, they are looking for either or, um, but again, look at what you're getting and make sure you understand what that credential is for. Okay. So that's my advice on that one. And one more question because I'm at 26 minutes and it's going to cut me off. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a nurse. Uh, will it be easy for me to do? So sometimes it's hard for nurses to transition from, from being a nurse to being a medical coder because it is different. We are like looking at the documentation, whereas nurses are used to being active in that part. Uh, so I've seen nurses who get it and I've seen nurses who struggled. So it really all depends on the nurse and it depends on where they're getting their training. So that's my answer on that one. I'm gonna go ahead and close this one up because I don't want this to cut off on me. So if you are a medical coder, a medical coding student, somebody curious about the fascinating world of medical coding, a provider or a nurse, I invite you to like and subscribe and follow me on my journey in medical coding. And I hope that y'all will share this. So I will see y'all next time. Bye.